the Lord this morning. Uh, let's remember Brother John Crothers. He's, uh, he needs a lot of touch from the Lord at this time, uh, the things he's gone through and still has a while to go. So, But is there other requests as we uh, look to the Lord as well? Unspoken, yes. A transplant, yes. <coughs> okay. All right, let's all bow our head. Heavenly Fathers, we come before thy throne of grace. And we thank you, Lord, that we can approach thee through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've seen those that, Lord, that need a touch from thee this morning. I pray, Lord, touch their bodies, touch, Lord, their needs at this time. And there may be even those, Lord, that has unspoken requests, Lord, that, Lord, you know the thought of every mortal being on the planet. And, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you be with us here this morning in the song service and every part of it. And with thy nation, Israel, Lord, we ask this this now in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray amen and amen Let me see it this time as brother Paul come lead us in the song service good morning praise the Lord it's good to see everyone I'll stand for Jesus and let the world go by. I'll claim his promise, he will supply. We'll walk together, the Lord and I. This world go by in the world filled with pleasure we're tempted and tried the more we have here on earth the less we're satisfied the only thing that's lasting is coming down Peace. 
let the world go by I'll stand for Jesus and let the world go by I'll bring His promise He will for Jesus. When I look around and see all the good things He's done for me I know I'm unworthy
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy, not as I am. He views me in garments as white.
minute selection. Do you guys know what number it is? Jesus, son, my pardon, this I surely know. You took my place on Calvary, I won't have to go. All my life I give, he gave his for. You can live as you please, 
but you must pay the cost and the highway to heaven so it goes by the cross thank you Lord anybody have a testimony this morning or something on their hearts She had called me and sh she was in a situation where she was beside herself. She says, if God doesn't intervene, I don't know what I'm going to do. So uh, I did go up and I prayed, had her pray for and uh, after service I had went to her house and I had told her, I says, you know, I, went, I stood for you in prayer and she kind of was scared. She says, you didn't say anything, did you? And I said, no, I didn't say nothing. And uh, she, she called me up, it was the following week, and she said, you know, you know the power of prayer. And uh, he did, he come in for her, and uh, I just want to thank God yes, that he's no respecter of persons. Yes. Whoever calls upon him, he's there for them also. Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. His word does say, when two or three gathered in his name, he'd be there. Uh, keeps his word. Are you up for it, Diane? <laughs> Find it, Diane? No. Might have to pass on that. Don't have the words, you know. Uh, I want to thank the Lord too. Uh, Mireille uh, flew home uh, Friday, and we're pretty excited. We hadn't seen her in a year, and uh, she got to the airport with the three kids, and uh, she got on the plane. The plane didn't take off right away. It was snowing over there, so uh, 40 minutes turned into an hour, and an hour turned into two hours. So they're still sitting on the on the airplane, and they haven't moved. And it's a four-hour flight, so the three little kids. So we were praying, Lord, do something. And uh, the youngest one had a fever, and. Uh, we just prayed that the Lord would undertake, and he did. Um, after two hours, they did leave, but of course, she was mix, mix, uh, missing her connecting flights, and uh, so while she was in the air, I made a phone call to Air Canada, and uh, 
they fixed it all up. Instead of flying into Halifax, and she had two more connections. Instead of doing all that, they flew her right to Moncton. So he answers prayers in, in ways that we we don't understand sometimes. And uh, I'm just so thankful. Can I ask for in Jesus? Put it in 
God's hand because I know we've all not always been wisest in our decisions and things we've made. And, and I know the Lord, he has his ways of um, either correcting us or doing what we need to learn and our house sold so quickly and then we didn't know where we'd end up but it felt like home as soon as we bought this new little house and, and I know that the Lord had his hands in it all and, and um, like Paul was saying about me again coming home how I know time and time again how we pray for different things he, he works things out in ways that we couldn't even figure things out even better than you would figure things out. And same as when she was traveling, I was praying that the Lord would cause some people to help her out and to be there for her. And when they got in, uh, the three boys were sleeping. It was midnight, and uh, and there was a man that had carried one of the, the boys out of the plane, and he was sleeping in his stroller. And, so I'm just so thankful how he he does it again and again and every time that I something comes up and we worry or um, he's always there just as I was driving this morning thinking of our Heavenly Father how he cares and, and um, I'm just so grateful and so thankful for his love and his mercy and for his goodness and his grace and just for being here. Oh, the Lord is so good. When you think about it, someone that would love you so so good that, that he would rather die than live without you. That's what Jesus did. He went to the he went to the cross and shed his blood and died that we might live, that we might be a part of the family, that we might be his children, his brothers and his sisters. Such, such love. And he said, unless the corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it falls in the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. And that's what happened when Jesus died for us. He surveyed his kingdom from the cross. 55. Same song again. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. My Father is omnipotent And that you can deny a God of might and miracles, tis written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Though here his glory has been shown, we The wonders of his 
forget that wonderful night in January back in 19 and, and 51 when I visited the Pentecostal church in Woodstock and I didn't know anything at all about the Lord and I can't tell you what the, the, what the preacher preached what the message was all I know I got so under conviction that I couldn't sit and I had to, I had to make it for the altar, and wept my way through. What a day that was! What a day! I've never been the same, or never will be the same, and don't want to be the same. I love him with all my heart. He'd been so good to me this winter, and so far, and. I've been seeking the Lord. And there's treasures that's, that's still there to be found. Praise the Lord. And, and uh, I'm finding some, and I thank him for it. God bless you. I love you. Sister Monique, would you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. Through every trial I face, I know he's always there. When it seems hard to press on, he shows me he always cares. Couldn't repay the love he's shown, but he still bids me on. God's surely been good.
Crystal, would you have a song this morning? Just a chorus this morning. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me.
First of all, I'd like to thank the Lord for, for keeping me, especially in my condition. And I thank my wife, because she's done so much for me. And I appreciate her so much. And my daughter's just had a child and a new grandchild for us, and it's a pleasure in our home. And I just thank the Lord today. Everybody happy? Yes, we'll turn the uh, service over to Brother Fred. You could all stand, please, and change your positions. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of this service, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for the, thy spirit, Lord, and for the songs of Zion. But, Lord, as we would look at this morning into your word, I just pray, Lord, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. We're asking it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. <clears throat> you can be seated this morning. Still up. <clears throat> again, I found the horse again. Still on the same message that uh, we're on last week. I believe there's things that what the prophet Ezekiel saw way back 600 years before Christ. There are types what he saw in a vision, now remember, it's a vision. And sometime a vision, you can see the reality as it's actual. But most of the time in a vision, it's symbolic. It's showing something. And to show something that in the hour that you and I live in, there's a lot of things that in this hour that mankind has come across, and if you go on the internet, you'll find all kinds of subject or the flavor of whatever you want to hear. You can hear a lot of things. But I have to say 99% don't know the time they're living in. God called Ezekiel to be a watchman for his hour. And he wasn't there for a watchman of the Ten Commandments. But it's to be a watchman of what was going to happen shortly and in his day that was going to come take place, yes, and would set a type of things that would be yet future. The book of Ezekiel. It's the largest prophetic book in the Old Testament. It takes from... 600 B.C. when he seen that vision of heaven being opened up. And when heaven was opened up to Ezekiel, that was the first time for mankind having heaven being opened up and brought to the earth of man could see a vision in that manner. I know Moses was seen to make the type. God told him to make the types after the pattern of heaven. But Ezekiel is the only one in the Old Testament 
that sees the visions of heaven. But as he's looking and seeing what we're going to see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, he's looking at it and he sees what's happening in his day, but yet there's things in it that will project to our day. What Ezekiel saw in heaven at that hour was how the spirit world was to that point in time. Because remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam didn't see, although he was created in the spirit world, he didn't see what Ezekiel was seeing in his day. It's all there to tell you and I that God had a plan. And as his plan progresses, then God in the spirit world, things also progress as well. In Ezekiel's vision, you don't see the 24 elders that's in the book of Revelation. You don't see the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, there's a type that Ezekiel sees, that man sitting on the throne, that one day would be the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees some cherubims. There were cherubims in the Garden of Eden. And just to know that there's cherubims, just to hear the word and know the word, there's more to it than just knowing cherubims. In the Garden of Eden, as we were going to pick it up, as time would go progress, Adam was created in the spirit world. On the sixth day. And that's not a day of 24 hours. Man has been on earth for 6,000 years, but the earth is much older than 6,000 years. Where do you find scripture for that? Is there scripture? Yes, but God didn't describe everything in the book of Genesis. He said he, made, he created the heavens and the earth. He didn't tell Moses, because Moses wrote it later, and God showed him what it was. Moses didn't record how old the earth was. First of all, Moses didn't have an astronomical doctor degree to know what's going on in the heavens. He wouldn't know a whole lot of things about physics or any of those things, but God just told him I, he made the heavens and the earth in the beginning. And that's why scientists today say yes. They have instrument that proves the time. Now, it proves the time. Now, some say, well, no, it's not exact, so, so, it's not, so it, they can't prove. They know it's in 13.7 or 13.5 billion years ago that the earth was created, the heavens and the earth. We went through that subject a few weeks ago without going into a whole lot of details how that things were created. And from that time, while the, he created the heavens and the earth, call it the Big Bang if you like, God's the originator of it. There was no angels there at that time. Nor cherubims or any of those things. Because when I read in Isaiah, in a number of other places, God says, I created the heavens alone. And how many knows what the word alone means? There's no other people around. And before the earth was ever, that he brought forth the universe, God is light. He didn't fumble in the dark. Yes, he's light as far as the spirit of God is concerned. But he also lights his universe in the realm that he's at. So now he creates the heavens and the earth. Drop down in time now from about 13 billion years till you come to the time man was about to come on the scene. But before man came on the scene, 
Way back, in, you'll find in, in Isaiah and in other scriptures where when Satan's, that anointed cherubim, when the earth was created, his garden of Eden was stones, rocks. He walked on the, stone, the, fire, the stones of fire. Adam would have burnt to a crisp had that happened in that hour. So it shows from the creation of the Big Bang, before Adam even put on the scene, the earth was, was coming into formation, and then that's when the angelic beings came to be on the scene. Only then they come on the scene. Then as we move on further in time, now it comes time for God to judge Satan. And Satan was to rule or to watch over the creations of, the, of the, the life on earth. And we know from what Jesus said, he was a murderer in the, from the beginning. He brought violence on the earth in the prehistoric world. As he's done that, God judges him and now he becomes, he's no longer that morning star or that, that anointed cherub. Now he becomes a fallen angel. But he is a cherub. And the word cherub is singular for cherubims means plural. And so now as God has brought everything to a deep freeze after he's judged Satan, now God gets ready to put man. That's verse 2. God doesn't recreate the planet and those things. He says, let it be. He didn't say I created it. Let it be. In other words, let it come forth. Let their light strike the surface of the earth. Let the water divide and so forth. But then when he came to the animals... And man, he created man. But he created man on the sixth day. And each one of those days, as God is restoring the planet, they are days of around a thousand years each. You don't melt the big ice age that the, man, the last ice age man had in 24 hours. They found ice core. Now, those that just believe it, God created everything in six days, and it was just 6,000 6, years ago, there's ice core that dates 30, 300,000 years old. And the evidence is there to prove it. So Adam was brought in on the sixth creative, uh, the restoring day, which was 1,000 years. So when he was created on that sixth day, he was created in the spirit world, and he was there for a thousand years before God even put him on the earth. Because you'll find it's on the eighth day that God actually puts the man on the earth itself. So Adam had access to a whole lot of knowledge for a thousand years till, because God rested on the seventh day. There's another thousand years, right? And then on the eighth day, or if you want to, in Genesis chapter 2, that's where God actually now puts man on the earth in a physical body form. And man, had he not sinned, he'd have, Adam would have been the place where Jesus Christ would be. But man fell. Because remember, Jesus is the second Adam, not the second God. But he was created without sin, so forth, yes, 2,000. 4,000 years later after Adam, who was only God's only begotten son, and God immersed himself in him, God working in and through his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's get back to the Garden of Eden. Now, as man sinned, before Adam sinned, in the spirit world, a thousand years up there, he had access to the spirit world. But when he sinned on the earth, God sent four cherubim, now, Brother Fred, it doesn't say four cherubims. No, you're in Genesis chapter 3, verse 26. But the cherubim blocked every which way to the presence of God, not just one in front of him. And why would there be four cherubims? Because we can see it in the type in Ezekiel. We see it in the type in, also in the book of Revelation. As we see heaven in the chapter 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation, Four cherubims. And we'll see that these four cherubims, that they're positioned in a type, what we see in Ezekiel, 
That is to protect them from going to the presence of God Almighty. So God had four cherubims. That's why I didn't say cherub, one cherub with one sword. Sometimes they, you see pictures portrayed Adam coming out of the garden. Here's one angel, a cherub with, a, with four wings, and he's got a sword. That's one. That's cherub, not cherubims. Now, why is this all important? Each of these things portray to you and I how God is consistent. If he's created certain angelic beings for a function, they are there for that function throughout eternity. Ministering angels will always be ministering angels. There's three classes of angels. There's winged creatures, like the cherubims and seraphims and so forth. But then there's angels that is in the form of a man without wings. And those without wings are Gabriel, as an example, is uh, Michael, the archangel, and also Melchizedek. There are not pictures as wings in the scripture. When we look at the book of Daniel, when Daniel seen, he seen that man, he says, I seen that man clothed in white linen. But then it refers to, to the man Gabriel. Gabriel was not a man in the sense of, of the family of man. He was of the angelic beings. And he being in fine linen, do you know what the fine linen represents? Eternal life, yeah, that's one thing. But fine linen, its origin starts with the priestly garment. The bride is to be dressed in fine linen. Aren't you and I priests unto our God? He, Jesus made us priests, kings and priests unto God. And so therefore the fine lim, linen is a type of representation of priesthood. Now we're going to go into the scripture. In Ezekiel. And in the first chapter, verse 4 it says, now remember, this is in 600 B.C., Ezekiel is not in the land of Israel. He's in Babylon. He's been there for six years in Babylon. He doesn't know all the rumors that are happening in Israel. Although he hears something that does come to his ear. But as he's now in by the river Shebar, which is in the Babylonian Empire... And I look, and behold, a whirlwind of the north. Not the north pole. The north part of the city of Jerusalem is where it's at, he's looking at. A great cloud, a fire enfolding unto itself. That's that same cloud that Moses saw when they crossed the Red Sea, and that pillar of fire was an enfolding cloud. It's showing the presence of God. Brightness about it and out of the midst thereof, the color of amber in the midst of the fire. Same colors as Moses describes that pillar of fire. Now here, Ezekiel now starts to take God showing him a furtherance of what those four cherubims were doing in the Garden of Eden. Now, time has moved on. By the time you read Ezekiel's day, remember, from Adam's day to Ezekiel's day, Mo God told Moses to build an ark, that he would meet them on that ark inside the holies of holy. And there would be two cherubims that would cover the mercy seat, and the presence of God would be there to meet the high priest once a year. 
And so that was a natural, uh, because he was, Moses was told to make after the pattern what he saw. But now Ezekiel sees it in heaven, and it's, no, it's the type that what Moses had made, now we have also four cherubims, and remember God dwelled between, he lives between two cherubims. He's not sitting on a little box that was made in the days of Moses. There's no boxings in heaven. There's no physical things in heaven. So God dwells between two cherubims, but now he also speaks about four cherubims, and here's what we're going to find out. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now in case you're confused, you'll read in the scripture sometimes four living creatures, the four beasts, or the four, or the four cherubims. Because Ezekiel will say those living beasts, those living creatures were cherubims. It's just how God uses the prophet to describe what he's looking at. So the four living creatures and their appearance was like unto the appearance of a man. So he appears like a man, but he has wings. And everyone had four faces, and everyone, and everyone had four wings. And their feet were as the feet of, of the soles of their feet was like the soles of a calf foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Or, and they had hands of a man under their wings. Now see, they, these have wings, although they described as a man. On their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Now here's a clue why the cherubim and how their position is important. And their wings were joined one to another. Now as you see the picture here on the screen. Now don't go to seed with the picture that you see on the screen. But if their wings was to touch to one another... They cannot be in a straight line. And in, in the Revelation chapter 4, they cannot be positioned in that way either. Because if their wings touch one another, the only way that you can have it touch one another is this way. They are formed around the throne. Why are they positioned that way? It's to set a type. What was told to, in Genesis 3.26, those cherubims were there to stop going to the presence of God from every direction. And when man measures directions, there's four directions, north, east, south, and west. So these cherubims touching their wings are in this formation Around the throne, because in Revelation chapter 5 or 4, it says that these living creatures were around the throne, not in front of the throne. They are protecting, guarding the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, maybe I'll go to that picture. Now, this is not correct. Here, the picture right in front. But the reason that these cherubims are pictured all around is, why is it all around? If sinful mankind, if God put those cherubims in the Garden of Eden for man not to have access to the spirit world, that would remain even to the day of our hour. Now there is one that sits on the throne. We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And these cherubim blocks the way from all intellectual, say, uh, tears, trying to reach the throne, but they can't because their revelation is blocked by these cherubims. They can only have ideas, but not revelation. But to the bride of Jesus Christ, we come through because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only access that these cherubims will allow access to the throne. Ain't that wonderful? 
Now, if God sent cherubim to block the way, there's no doctor, divinity, no highly educated person that can try to figure out what God is. Or the Godhead. Or any revelation in the Word of God. They can understand from an intellectual point of view, but they don't have a revelatory point of view. Well, praise the Lord. So, we're going to go on. Now, in verse 10 it says, And for the likeness of their face, they had four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, on the right side, and they four had four faces of an ox on the left side, and they also had the face of an eagle. So they have four faces. Now, why have four faces? Now, you've heard the expression, well, you're two-faced. Do you actually have two faces? No. It's to represent something. It's speaking of something. So these cherubs, yes, they're pictured as having four faces. But it's to portray their work. Because when we read them in the book of Revelation, as we see them in the seals, They are to guard against Satan attack. The four heads of the Old Testament on those cherubims, they were there to guard against things that would come against Israel concerning those four empires that came and destroyed Israel. In the New Testament, it's how Satan riding on that horse or the different colored horses that they are to put there their, to hold back Satan against the true child of God, against the onslaught of Satan. Now, when it says, and sometimes because we can't marry the two together, when that first horse rider went out, he had a bow but no arrow. That's not the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first age, he was as a lion. And why was that first cherubim as the face of a lion? It's to portray the characteristic of Christ for that first age. Now remember, why does God use cherubims in the grace age for each of those sealed periods of time? It's because a cherub is required to come against another Sherb. Remember, Satan was that anointed Sherb. He was the most highest angel of the angelic family that there ever was. So the war in the Grace Age, as Satan moves his tactics, each one of these Sherbums are opposing him so the true child of God, so the word of God can have its preeminence in each one of those seven church ages as we would go through. All right? So that's why the four heads... The four heads are not seen in the Garden of Eden, but they are, they are cherubims protecting the way to God. Also in the days of Ezekiel. Now I want to drop down to verse 26, instead of reading the whole vision again like I did last week. Now as... He's finishing describing what those cherubims were like. There was eyes in their wings and in their feet and all over. That means the Spirit of God was in them and they can see everywhere. And the wheels as well. The wheels had eyes. And the wheels, it's not a wheel in the middle of a wheel turning in that way. It's a wheel that's perpendicular to the other one to show they can go in any direction, just like the cherubim would go in any direction. But now as his attention is seeing to verse 26... And he says here, And above the firmament that was over the heads, that was like a, th a likeness. Now he says it's the likeness of a throne. He didn't say, I saw the throne. The likeness is showing you this is symbolic. And the appearance of a sapphire, and upon the likeness of the throne 
was the likeness and the appearance of a man upon it. Now, this is a prophecy that's not completely finished. It's ongoing. But this prophecy that he sees here, the vision that he sees, we will see it in more complete as John describes it in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. But now John will see that man that's going to be sitting on that throne because he will have been born. He will also see the 24 elders. He'll see the, those in white robes. He saw those under the sea of glass. Now, Ezekiel didn't see that in his day because it didn't exist and it wasn't important for, to show the element that was to receive this vision in their days in 600 B.C. So there's this man that sits upon, upon it. And I saw the color of amber and the appearance of fire around about it and within and appeared unto his loin and even upwards and the appearance of his loins even downwards and I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had the brightness round about as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain and so is, was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance and the likeness. If it was actual you wouldn't use the word likeness. I saw the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice spake that spake. So now we're going to move to chapter 10, because in chapter 10, Ezekiel again is looking at that same vision, but he's describing it now in other details that he didn't mention in chapter 1. And we're going to see some things here this morning. Starting at verse 1. Then I looked and behold in the firmament that was above the heads of the cherubims. So higher than the cherubims. These are the four cherubims. These are not the two cherubims that's, that God dwells between. All right? There's a difference. So these four cherubims that had the four faces and the four wings, above them now he's looking towards the throne area. And the appearance was the likeness of a throne. Now, let's catch it. Now remember, he's seen something. It's in the likeness. It's to portray some things about what will be in the book of Revelation. And he spake. Who spake? The one that's sitting on the throne. Unto the man clothed in linen. He didn't speak to himself. Why would he want to put in, God want to show Ezekiel that the one that's sitting on the throne, which we know is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's he talking to? Did he just project himself and says, I'm talking to myself? No, he's talking to an angelic being that's there. Because remember, this is a heavenly vision. It's not a man that God threw up there and he's seen there. This is an angelic being. And that man is clothed with linen. Why does it have to say he was clothed with linen? Because he has that priestly garment on him. Gabriel in Daniel is seen with a fine linen. In chapter 12, the man in fine linen that was upon the waters. These are angelic beings. They're not men. So he that sat on the throne commanded the man that was clothed in linen to do what? Grab fire. Okay, let's read it. Um, but, okay. And he that spake unto the man that was clothed in linen, go between the wheels, even under the cherub. 
and fill thy hand with coal from between the cherub and scatter them over the city. This angelic being is pictured of going where the presence of God is at, not where the four cherubims are at. Because remember, he's above. The cherubims are down below, below that, what Ezekiel sees. They're not in the same position. So he talks to man, go between the cherub. And what cherub would that be? That's the type where God dwells between two cherubims, where his presence at. Go and grab the coal. Now he's not grabbing physical coal, hot coal like you would burn in years gone by. I remember when I was young, uh, hot coal ashes was pretty hot. But it's hotter than fire sometimes. You that's of a teenager direct age, you, I don't think you've seen burning coal. They, people hardly don't use that anymore here. So he went to get the fire coal. What is the coal for? It burned something up. And he's told to take those coals and throw it to the city. In the hour that was told that man to do it, which Ezekiel was going to fulfill that type, Ezekiel is not that man in fine linen, but he's going to be the voice of that angel that's taken the coals and is going to be thrown down to the earth, which is a judgment speaking on the city of Jerusalem. It says, throw it to that city to do what? God is, is to burn up because God is displeased because the Jews at that hour had idols in their, church, in their synagogue, just like the Catholic Church has idols in her church as well. And if you talk to a Catholic, please don't get offended. But most of your statues that's in the Vatican were pagan gods and just gave them New Testament names to them. They're just as guilty as Israel was 600 years B.C. And God brought judgment on Israel because of that. There's going to be a judgment for that church when the time comes. That's that mystery Babylon. Oh, by the way, while well, since we're talking about that, two things come to mind. On Halloween, which is a pagan celebration to begin with, Started by the Catholic Church, because they say it's all Eve of all saints states, or whatever it was. But in 1517, on October 31st, Martha Luther put the 95 Thesis on the door of Gutenberg in Germany. This Halloween that just passed, Last week, last week, well, the 31st, yeah, sorry, yeah, well, it's exactly 500 years, and they sign with the Protestant denomination, that the evangelical, that they, Luther, and they are just one now, and they celebrated it in the very church where Luther put the thesis on the door. Now that's prophecy in fulfillment. That's not a fresh revelation, but it's seeing God's word coming to pass. It's a vindication what's been revealed. That they would come together to be a one world church at the end. And my son sent me an email. Because of the shortage of priests, the Pope has now is pushing and making a decree that the priest can marry. Hello. I can see the process. Oh, wow. Priest can marry now. Now we, that's out of the way. That, we got more in common now. They're compromising on the word of God for fellowship coming together. And it's because of love that has blinded the world into it. And that same spirit of Satan is working even in this message using love to blind the people. You have gospel men, not watchmen in this hour. 
Oh, I better not go there. I got to. I'm going to preach a sermon one of these days, and it's going to probably burn. But anyway, getting back to Ezekiel. So he is told to throw the coals of fire, which would be judgment falling on the nation of Israel at that hour. All right. And now he said, scattered over, over the city. Now, this as being a type of what happened in the days of Ezekiel, you go to Revelation chapter 8, and you see a repeat of it, not to the nation of Israel, well, to the nation of Israel, yes, in one sense, but we're going to see the hour that we live in. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 8. In Revelation chapter 8, everyone's looking and waiting for this. Your Pentecostals are, your Brenhamites are, the Jacksonites are. Everybody's looking, knowing the seventh seal. Now, granted, there's some in the days that Brother Brown was on the scene, some were looking at the seventh seal should have been broken in 1963. Well, here's a proof that you were wrong. God has revealed a whole lot more since then. That seventh seal will only be revealed when this book has been revealed. There's a whole lot of things that was been opened up since 1963. But I'm sticking with the message. Yes, and you're going to run in circles in your message because they don't have the spirit of revelation. They have the spirit of intellect. They grew up in tutorship in it, and they don't go no further. Now, the true child of God that has the spirit of revelation instead of intellect, he will see God as he moves on. The others don't. You'll never hear a peep anything about them, about things that God's been doing in this hour. Shame on you. They'll turn around. Well, and... You're going to get some negative comments on when you start saying things like that. I'm not saying that to make them feel bad. Wake up! Okay, let's, let's stop from there. Let's go to the book of Revelation. In chapter 8, and when, the, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for the space of half hour. Now, what are these seals significant of? Jesus, while he sits on the throne during the grace age, in his hand is a uh, scroll with seven seals that has the redemption name of all those that's going to, that's, he's going to be re he's redeeming for. And when the time comes, that hour that he himself does not know the hour of the day when to open that seventh one, because of that day and the hour, no man knoweth except the Father, not even the Son knoweth. He even said it himself. But there's coming a day that seventh seal will be opened. And when it does open, then a number of things starts to unfold. And the watchman knows what's going on in that hour. And there will be fresh revelation in that hour, not in just in days gone by. Seeing an event taking place like the miracle war is not a fresh revelation. That's only a fulfillment of a revelation that's already been revealed. All right, so we are in now in the half hour silence. It shows the seventh seal is open. There's going to be a number of things unfolding. It's not all, as you read a history book, everything in that chapter. But the, the first thing when you see when that seventh seal is broke. And I saw seven angels that stood before God, and seven trumpets were given unto them. They were given to getting ready to shout, sound those trumpets. Those trumpets are for the Jews, and it's for the week of Daniel up ahead. But watch what happens. That's just to present them. You're at the borderline of the transitional period of time, where God's going to wrap up the bride and then move to the Jews. But as he goes in here, he says here, And another angel came and stood at the altar. Where? On earth? In glory, because that's where the seal is open. Having a golden censer, 
And there was given unto him much incense. For what? You'd, what are the incense in the burning of prayer? It's sweet smelling savor to God. And stood by the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of A-L-L. All prayers. From Adam to the seventh seal, Roman, till the bride goes up in the rapture. Because we're going to, you'll find prayers that are being offered, or not offered, that are held in Revelation chapter 5, I believe it is, where, yeah, it's in chapter 5. And it's in verse 8. And when he had taken up the book and the four beasts, what are those four beasts? They were there from the beginning from the Garden of Eden. And the 24 elders, what does that represent? Twelve patriarchs of the new, the twelve apostles of the old, I mean, and twelve apostles of the new. That is showing history of time right to the garden. And they fell down before the land, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of order, which are the prayers of the saints. And nowhere does you see in that chapter that they were offered. They're just holding them. Why? For a day and the hour when that seventh seal is broke, and now this angel, he takes all the prayers and he's offering up because redemption has come to a close. And when he does that, Where does he offer those prayers? We don't know. You don't want to know. Those prayers are opened up over here. Just prior to the bride going into the rapture. That's where that angel, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, is offering up all the prayers. Because when you and I get to heaven, and those are in heaven, you will. there's not a prayer prayed in heaven. It's done down here. The Bible clearly declares that. So the prayers being all offered up, you're in that half hour time period of time. Or the seventh seal time factor. But when he offers the prayers, he's at the end of it. And when he's finished offering up all the prayers, and the bride is now is going to go up in a rapture, now that angel can turn his attention towards the nation of Israel. Because he says here, I was given much ancient the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the, before the throne. So it shows it's not taking place on the earth. Uh-uh. Up there. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saint uh, ascended up before God in the hands of the angel. And this angel offering up, now remember, in Ezekiel, he's shown in fine linen. The book Revelation doesn't give the fine linen description. But it's the same angel because he's going to be taking fire again. And that angelic being that's doing it is not the Lord Jesus Christ. You would think it would be Jesus offering all the prayers to, to God. It is not the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an angelic being. Why? Hebrew chapter uh, 2 verse 16 says, Jesus never took on the nature of angels. He's of the family of man. No man is going to be an angel itself. Get that out of your head. Yes, we'll be like the angel when we go to glory, having a glorified body, but that don't make you of the family of the angel. It only makes you a family of man. So therefore, this angel is doing this is an angelic being. He is in a fine linen, according to Ezekiel. He's in a priestly function. Only a priest could offer in the before the throne of God, the prayers of all the saints in the Old Testament. That's what the type is like. 
Read your Bible. But here he is. Now what's he doing here? And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire from the altar and cast it to the earth. This time he say he's not casting it to the city because in Ezekiel's day, it was to the city which represented the Jewish nation. But this time he's going to cast it onto the earth. Not anywhere. Why is it earth? Because it's going to start, yes, with the Jewish people, but it's going to be global. Okay? We have been revelated. One, I'm sure you have heard it. Let's see, where is it? Yeah, right here. Those first three trumpets that was preceded before the angels doing this. Those are not trumpets of joy. Warnings. What are those two prophets going to be doing? Bringing judgment. First on the nation of Israel. But when we read the last three trumpets, if you know anything about the book of Revelation, now the judgment is not just on that nation of Israel. It's on the whole world. So that's why he's casting it to the earth in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. I'll praise the Lord. And when the week finishes out, and I know sometimes we like pictures, this scene that's up in glory, as John was taken up in 96 AD to this present day of time, He's seeing it somewhat in what you would see in this picture here. I says, don't go to see it on the picture because the cherubims were around the throne. But what is up there in heaven when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in his physical second coming, everything that's up there is coming down to the earth where Jesus is going to sit on his throne the rule and reign for the, in the millennium. I and my Father are one. They're one in purpose. Some like to represent it as the Son is God himself, which is an error. Because Jesus was born. Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross of Calvary. The great eternal spirit doesn't have a body or form. He can't die and he has no blood. But he that is invisible came in his son to redeem you and I through him so we could see someone that we can look at, that we can see our God also. So yes, the two spirit became one. But who sees everything? Does Jesus see everything? Is he everywhere? No. Well, Christ lives in me. How do you see that? It's our, do you have two fathers? We have one father. And that Holy Spirit is a part of the spirit of Almighty God. There's only one God. It's just God uses the description of taking a part of his spirit and puts it into the believer. And it is him that sees everything. The son does not see everything. He is not everywhere present. So God, Jesus that dwells in me, when I say that, when Paul is saying that, he's dwelling, he's dwelling in you by revelation. The word Jesus is used to characterize the spirit of almighty God. So let's not get confused in portraying an erroneous picture. This is the hour God has opened up the picture marvelously of what the things we see. So now as that angel, in getting back to the 8th chapter, as he offers up the prayers of all the saints, that's why in Ezekiel, in chapter 10, that Ezekiel saw in a vision form, symbolic, 
that he that sat on the throne told him that was dressed in white linen, he was not speaking of himself, he was talking to an angelic being to offer up all the prayers of the saints. Now I know some of you are just going to turn wild, go crazy. It's because they don't have the spirit of revelation in them. Who is that angel in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5? Did God just take any angel off the shelf? Hey, you, it's your turn. To, you do that. He has a priestly garment on him. And there's only one angel that was represented in the scripture as being the, a high priest, because Jesus was made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. A, Gabriel wasn't. Michael wasn't. The four servants weren't. Well, Melchizedek was. I can see that angel in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, is none other but Melchizedek. He's offering the prayers of all the saints. That's not a little insignificant thing that's transpiring. Forget it. It's almost as important as the seals being opened. Because you want your prayers and all the, all the saints want their prayers to be offered up the right way. And God wants it the right way. Well, praise the Lord. Ezekiel was a watchman in his day. He was not a watchman for the Ten Commandments. He was the watchman of things that was about to transpire. Revelatory. In the hour that we live in now, We are living under the eagle spirit, which is a revelatory spirit. We're not living under the, the face of a man. Under the face of a man, they were gospel men preaching the gospel. There's nothing wrong with preaching the gospel. It's necessary. But if you don't have the spirit that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, then you can't be a watchman. I don't care what you claim yourself to be. A watchman will know what watch he's living in to begin with. And as God started with that eagle spirit, there's three watches, and we're living in the third one. And the reason you don't hear nothing mentioned of these things is because the majority of the ministry don't believe it. Listen to them. Why? They reject. He that refuses him that speaketh from heaven. You can call me what you like, but if this be God's word, where are you standing? Yes, that first watch that woke us up, that open six seal, was under the ministry of Brother Branham. And when he passes off the scene, well, I might as well just finish it. What I, maybe there's a little bit of what I want to talk about later on. There were that generation that, that, uh, that was alive during Brother Branham's ministry. A lot of, there's a number of people that heard his message. Yes, God allowed him to say dual statement, so to see who was having a revelation by the Spirit or who was having an intellectual revelation. And when God takes his man off the scene, the majority only had an intellectual revelation. Otherwise, they would have seen the apostle that God brought on the scene after. 
And I hope you're not blind that you can see the pattern. While that apostle was on the scene, and, and that's fulfilling Luke chapter 26, where the Lord come down on earth to feed his servants down here. That's what Luke cha chapter says. Just prior to his second coming, it says in Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 30, uh, 35, 36, that he's feeding his servants down here, not in glory. Yes, there's a wedding supper in glory, but Revelation is fed down here. And it's there where he says, what about if I come in the second watch or a third watch? And if you don't want to know, you're going to be excluded. It's that simple. It's serious. If you don't know what a watchman knows what watch he's in. That's why he's called a watchman, not a gospel man. That don't mean everyone has to preach revelation, but if there's a rejection of it, then the word, you've got no place to hide. The word points you out. The true child of God sees the difference. Those that's falling asleep and fall, just falling along on somebody's coattail, they're not going to see no difference. They're not going to know any difference. And God's raising up another generation now. And they're not seeing it, just like those in the days of Brother Jackson. The Branham people didn't see what was happening to them, but they ran in circles. They were running circles here. Now, may I say, well, well, we have revelation. We, we know revelation. Was, it was revealed. The miracle of war was revealed, what, 20 years ago? When it comes to past, that's just a fulfillment of a revelation back there. That's not fresh meat. That's not fresh revelation. Come on, wake up. Well, I don't mean to sound. All right, so under tutorship, under that generation, while under tutorship, the intellectual receives the same thing as a child of God receives. He has it in a mental understanding. But when it comes time that he's now a generation pushed forward to be in the front lines of holding the gospel, they can't go any further because they don't have the spirit of revelation. And that's also happening in the days of Brother Jackson. But we're, we got the message. We're holding the message. Is it from an intellectual point of view or revelatory point of view? Didn't the comfort says he'll show you things to come? Did he stop in 2004? Huh? They don't have an answer. And they won't answer either. So showing a fulfillment or an event comes to place of something that's previously been revealed is not a fresh revelation. It's not fresh meat. And the spirit of Revelation chapter 19 verse 10 and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if you have it, show it. And number two, if God is bringing things forward as he always has been doing, he's going to use a means to bring that truth out to the world. Not hide it in a simple assembly somewhere. Because God will cause that truth to be made known publicly. Well, I know where I stand this morning. I know what God has shown. Sevenfold light, is that of the devil or is it of God? The, okay, well, this whole, lot, this whole lot of things we could bring in. The God has done some things since 2004. That exceedingly great army of Ezekiel, chapter 37, is that of the devil or is that of God? Uh, 
about we don't want to say. We won't say because they don't like the servant who's doing it. It's amazing. A prophecy came forth in around a month before Brother Jackson passed away. And here's what was given. Little ones of mine, I say this day that I speak by my spirit. I say, run into the cleft of the rock. Do not think to put your own ideas in my plan. And some have done that. For I say, surely, thou shalt surely come to failure in thy life. I say, but look unto me, look unto me, the Lord thy God. For I say, I am the author and finisher of all things. I have created all things. I have chosen minister who I have desired and seen fit. I do not put, it says, sorry. I say, do not put your ideas in my plan. For I say, it will surely come to failure. But I say, lean on me. Lean on the everlasting arms. Listen to my spirit. And my spirit will speak to the inner being. For I say, I have called and I have chosen whom I see fit. And men wants to lift up other men that are not fit for certain offices. For I say to you, do not put your own ideas in my plan, said the Lord this day. That was just a month less than when Brother Jackson passed away. And look what has happened. If you have the spirit of prophecy of Revelation chapter 19.10, and if you're a watchman, you're obligated to bring it forth. But if it can't bring it forth, the warning bell should go on. No one chooses to be, well, okay, uh, uh, I'm a pastor. I want to be an evangelist now. You can't choose what you want, and you can't choose the men that God chooses to be such. Now, not lifting up a man, but I'd have to say, Brother Mims is definitely an evangelist. Is there any doubt in your mind? Is it because someone said he's an evangelist? No, his ministry proves what it is. You'd have to be blind not to see that it's not. This is an hour God is through playing church. He's going to take men out of the way that are interfering with his plans. Well, I thank God for, I mean, if I'm preaching error, then it's duty bound for the true child, the true ministry to take the word here and to show that it's in error. It's not an option. It's a must. Well, he's just trying to lift up himself. I didn't ask to be a preacher. I was forced in the corner to be a preacher. Brother Jim that was here before as the pastor had asked many times whether I want to come in and to help in the pastoring this church. I said, no. But he said, but if something happens, will you step in? And then I opened my mouth and I said, well, yeah, okay, if something happens, I'll step in. I wasn't looking for a ministry. I was just happy just sitting where you are. Because it's a whole lot easier than being up here. Well, I said, well, I, 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 you should be saying this and that. Well, then come up here. And see what it's like when you're under the gun and under fire. You'll soon put your tail between your legs and you'll go back and you see. But it's God that lifts up. He's, uh, these revelations, I don't go home and cooking up things that are coming. He, by the Spirit, will drop things 
And I'm not the only servant in that way. The other servant that is in, that has that spirit of prophecy, is not in North America. He's on another continent. I'm not saying that to lift up the brother, but if you can't see by what he's preaching, then I have to say, you're just here on an intellectual point of view. But I thank God that the bride's not going to go up in a rapture and seeing things are coming to place on an intellectual point of view. God wants watchmen in this hour, not gospel men. There's nothing wrong with preaching the gospel. Hey, there's yet some new ones that may come in. But is the bride in its infancy in this hour? Aren't we coming near to completion, a mature bride? Revelated? Sure. Well, I can hear the negative comments next week. But I'll only expose who has truth and who don't. When people heard Brother Brandon speak, when Revelation was actually coming down the line, did it take the people of that hours years and years to find out if it was true? Maybe the intellectual ones one was, but not the true child of God. And when God brought an apostle on the scene, is it because from an intellectual point of view, you say, oh, he's that man, and so anything he says, that's, that's right. And I can see it on an intellectual point of view. Well, God was going to prove that out when he takes them off the scene. The evidence is clear before you. Well, let's just stand. Heavenly Fathers, we come to this part of the service. Truly, Lord, we're living in an hour, Lord, that you are still, Lord, leading this bride. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you have brought in our day, Lord. I just pray, Lord, open the eyes, Lord. Let not Satan, Lord, hinder or blind anyone from seeing the truth. And now I commit the rest of the service in your hands. In that name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. Have your position in case someone has, still has a need. Praise the Lord. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for me.
listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name, for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls. Let's just stand. I just want to, I forgot to mention something to you as well. Those cherubims that we see four, when that heavenly scene from heaven comes down to the earth, when Jesus sits on the throne, no, you won't see cherubim, but there on the walls of the temple and on the doors of the temple, there's only portrayed two cherubims, the face of the lion and the face of a man. One is to portray Jesus Christ as being king in the millennium, and the face of a man is the bride that is there healing, working to heal the nations. On top of that, when that is in the millennium, there is no eagle spirit because all revelation has been revealed. There's no cast spirit because there's no killing among the nations. That's why those two are not pictured as the type put on the temple that will be in the millennium. There will only be two types of cherubims to work during that millennium. Right there. Is that? Didn't know that, but read it. it, it you'll find it in Ezekiel. Ezekiel only expressed two. Not the four. Brother Ray? Let me just dismiss us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your wonderful goodness to us. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would dismiss your children now with your blessing. Give us traveling mercies. Be with each one throughout this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.